So what I will do is I will teach some historical theology that you should know, but you may not know. In any case, she asked, the question she asked was, all right, if these guys knew, if these and guys knew, guys and gals knew, that it didn't work, then why did they continue to follow? And that's a wonderful question. I think it's very easily answered. What didn't work? Uh, I'm sorry, the sacrificial system. You know, what we've been talking about in Hebrews this whole time and what the author told us. Right? In English, it's, it's not veiled in English very much. It is definitely not veiled in the Greek, and we will hear it again today. But the writer of Hebrews has told us that the sacrificial system is a parable. It does not work to solve the problem of sin. Period. Die. That's it. Bang. We know this because that was the sermon that Paul made in Acts. And if you look at the Jewish New Testament handbook, which I, okay, you, you don't need to get it. I got a copy of it. It's this thick. I've read it through a couple of times. But the Jewish New Testament handbook talks about what Jews believe, what the Jewish people believe. And it will state, it states emphatically, there are 36 things which are not pardonable, irredeemable. No sacrifice will ever Redeem them. And the number top one is intentional sin. In the Talmud, yes, in the Talmud from the Mishnah, the rabbis state emphatically there is no sacrifice for, for intentional sin, only for unintentional sin. So therefore the question, which is a very legitimate question, then why did they continue to believe what they believe? And the answer starts, and this is a historical theology. I'm going to start the historical theology. I'm going to go through a very brief, but hopefully understandable point here. So let's start in the beginning. In the beginning is Elohim. Elohim. Elohim is the word in Greek, or a word in Hebrew for gods. In the beginning was gods with a singular verb. In other words, gods held in the singular. And the ruach, if you want, this is God. And the ruach, ruach of God was over the waters. This is the Holy Spirit, ruach kodesh, okay, which in the, in the um, Greek is the hagios penum. And God Amar. And God Amar. The most key words are beginning. Okay, beginning. Which assumes if God is there in the beginning, the Alpha and the Omega, that means he is there when? It assumes what? It assumes Olim. In, in Hebrew, there are two <coughs> words for time, olim and yom. Yom, yom, yeah, H-M, yom. Yom and olim. Olim means eternity, yom means a period of time. These are the two words in Hebrew, period, duh. When it says there is a day, it does not word, use the word day, it uses the word yom in the, in the Old Testament. The word yom is usually trans, can be translated day, month, year, week, uh, an aeon or an age, okay? Olim is, is eternity. Do you notice anything likeness between these two words? Because it's an intentional likeness. Olim, because it says in the beginning, in the beginning was God. God with a singular verb. You can't forget this. It's a singular verb. But the word Olim and Elohim have similar declinations in Hebrew. The assumption is that God is eternal. The assumption is also that God has three parts. Three parts being God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Amar. The Amar is the Son. The Son is the action of God in the creation. Basically, the ketesis, the cosmos, 
You got to write Sarks, Psuche, and Panuma. Sarks, Psuche, Panuma. Sarks is the Amar. Panuma is the Holy Spirit. Suke is the mind of God. Thought. The assumption, and they're not precise or exact, but they're close enough, okay, for government work. So, and even close enough for civilian work. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I did to interrupt, but I was scribbling my notes as quick as, quick as I could. What's the other word for time? Hmm. Yom. Yom Kippur. Lem and Yom. Okay. Yom is a period of time. That's why. Y O M Y O H M. Okay. Um, it, 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 it's it's a uh, transliteration, so it's the best I can do. But Yom Yom Kippur is correct, the day of, okay. right? Yom, but it's really the period of, because Yom Kippur is not a single day, right? Okay. Right. It's a festival. In any case, Yom in Hebrew, in ancient Hebrew, means a period of time. There is no word. There is a word for. Uh, it is a combined word for year, for example, which means a folding of the months. The months is a folding of, actually means a lunar month. It does not, they're not periods of time like we think of periods of time, right? We, we break our periods of time like we say a day. The Greek, the Hebrews would say <coughs> a yom, sunset to sunrise, for example, would be within their construct a day. But it doesn't mean night, does it? The period of time at night would be sunset to sunrise. So there's, it's very complicated in ancient time. I'm, I'm not teaching about time. I just want to point out, in the beginning, the assumption is eternity, right? God is eternal, period, dot. This is an assumption, this, this uh, theological assumption that comes from the Old Testament. This is not, this is an affirmation of a theological assumption. You get to that through logic. Right, the logical reasoning. This is a um, when we make a logical statement, we start with um, our uh, assumptions. assumptions. Assumptions is two definitions. definitions, definitions, assumptions, argument, and conclusion. Conclusion. This is the way you develop a, a class, an argument, classical argument. The classic argument here is the assumption of the Old Testament is that, number one, God is eternal. Number two, God is three parts. I, I don't, you can, you can ignore this if you want at the moment. I'm just trying to help you out because the next stage is this, when God made man. God made man. He put two things, he did two things to make man. He took a dam. A dam is dirt. Dirt. We, did, we transform it dust, but it means literally red dirt, like Georgia dirt, red dirt. Adam is red dirt. <coughs> the Amar, the red dirt comes from the cosmos, from the creation. The other thing that he used to make man was nefesh. Nefesh <coughs> is the breath. It is not the spirit. When God made the animals, it does not say he used Adam, the dirt of the earth, to make the animals. I don't want to get into that point. That's a whole other theological thing that you can look at. But he put nefesh in the animals. He put nefesh in man. Man, in the context of the New Testament, is no different than the animals within that context. What makes man different, theologically? Like God. Like God. Because God said, let us, let us, Elohim, Elohim singular verb, but let us make man in our own image. What is the image of God? I gave it to you. The image of God is, God is eternal, and God is in three parts. God is eternal, and God is in three parts. This is the physical part of man. This is Sarks. You can try to push this into the Suke and Penuma all you want, but you can't. Because it says that God made man, these are like the animals, Adam and Nefesh, 
But where it says, God made man in him his image. Do you ever wonder what the image of God was? It doesn't look like God. What is God? Even the Hebrews knew that God did not look like man. Remember? Is God in the wind? Is God in the roar? Is God in the thunder? No. The still small voice but still, God is not an anthropomorphic being. God is an eternal being of three parts. And when God said, let us make man in our image, that means theologically that man is eternal and in three parts. Now, here's where the whole thing comes into the world, or the thing. What did the Hebrews Believe or no. This goes back to a very important point historically. Remember, we have our thing we have animism, we have pantheonic paganism, we have mysterion, and we have Gnosticism. This is the evolution of religion. What do animists care about? Yeah, but why? Do they care about it for salvation or where they're going after death? Explanation. It's more of an explanation of how nature works. It's an explanation of how nature works, but what are they most concerned with? Food. Food! Dying! Starvation! Okay? The animism is, okay, if I am good to the gods, basically, if I appease the gods, if I make the gods happy, if I do the right things within the context, then guess what? I'm fed, right? These guys don't have a care about anything to do with salvation or the ends. You know, when you die, you're dead, that's it. And by the way, what do the Sadducees believe? No resurrection. No resurrection. You're all at them in the fashion when you're dead, you're dead. Isn't that peculiar? Because the theology that comes directly out of the beginning of the Old Testament, the very first words of the Old Testament, define the theological being of God. And then it says, and we made man in our image, not in a dam in the fesh, but rather eternally and in three parts. Yes, sir? Then why do Sadducees concern themselves whether sins are forgivable or not? If there's no resurrection, if there's no salvation. Why because, do they care? Because their, their relation of the world comes out of an animistic view. The animistic view that they have developed in, Sad, in the Sadducees, they're the priests. So therefore, if you are right with God, then the world is right with you. Kind right? Of the whole Job thing. What's that? The whole Job thing. Yeah, it's a whole Job thing. And Job is, by the way, um, Job is probably a great uh, theological uh, boil down of the Old Testament view that, that you do the right things and God will. Bless you in this world. That's the Sadducee view. Sadducees, there's nothing else. However, we know, this is a point I want to make. We know from the very first words, the very first words that come out of the Old Testament of Genesis, is what? God is eternal. And God made man in his image. And we know it's not a physical image. It's not a them in the flesh. What is the image of God? This is that definition thing you start with. Now, the animistic view is people didn't care. In pantheonic paganism, what do you care about? What is the view of... Okay, let's look at the Greeks. The Greeks are the best example because they are probably the most sophisticated example of this. In their pantheonic paganism, what did they say? What did they relate after death? You went to... Hades, Hades, Hades. The thing is that the Greeks and the Greeks had already developed theologically and philosophically this view. The Greeks have a what view of the soul of man? Eternal. Eternal view. The Greeks had an eternal view from the beginning. They believed, in fact, most cultures he developed an eternal view of, of the soul of man. 
after they get through animism, they go to pantheonic paganism, and the number one thing we find is people are going, after death, you're going places. Usually you're going to one place. Where did the Hebrews say you went? Sheol, Sheol Gehenna. Yeah. Basically to hell, okay? The, the, these guys said to Hades. The, our ancestors said to Valhalla. But Valhalla was not a happy place. Read about it. Almost every time in pantheonic paganism, you're going to some place under the earth that's not necessarily a happy place. It isn't because you're good or bad. It's just because you are. And then comes along Mysterion. In Mysterion, what is Mysterion concerned with? Salvation. Salvation. Mysterion is all about salvation. In Mysterion, the view from pantheonic paganism goes from the idea of, okay... I'm going to Hades, but now we have an Elysian Fields. And if you're in Hades and you work your way up, you'll eventually work your way up to the Elysian Fields. And the stars said, well, if you're good enough in life, you go to the Elysian Fields, right? What's really funny in Gnosticism, we find this in Gnosticism and mysticism. Mysticism is a whole different track, okay? But we find in Gnosticism and using mysticism. Where does mysticism go? Mysticism is Hebrew, or uh, not Hebrew, uh, Hindu, Buddha, Taoism. You go back to the beginning. You are reincarnated, all right? You're reincarnated. Again, the assumption is an eternal soul, okay? Very interesting how this concept of the eternal soul. So the Hebrews did not believe in the eternal soul. And so what happened to them is at, just a second. Yeah. Can we, when you say Hebrews, can we assume Jews? Sadducees, yes, Jews. The early, I'm talking about ancient Hebrews in the beginning, okay, did not believe in the eternal soul. It was obvious. It is not just obvious. It is, should be self-evident from the Old Testament that man is an eternal soul. But the Hebrews did not get into the eternal soul until when? Maccabees? Yeah, really, until the Maccabees. Now, they, they started getting inklings. When do you think they started getting inklings? Let's, let's look at where they started. Okay, so they started in the Ur of the Chaldees, and they went to the Israel area. Here's the Levant, right? And then, because of famine, they went to Egypt. Egypt. What had Egyptians already invented or developed? The concept of the eternal soul. However, their eternal soul was really weird, wacko, right? We had Baha Kara. They had the five elements of the human being, right? And they believed that the eternal soul was conti continually wedded to the body, and therefore you had to, you know, mummies. make mummies. Yeah, make them into a mummy to keep them. So they got this idea of the eternal soul. They're not believing the eternal soul here, as far as we can tell. We don't know, because we don't have Sadducee literature. But the Sadducees some, somehow got, even today, Orthodox Jews believe that when you're dead, you're dead. You ain't going nowhere. There's no eternal soul in their view. They're still in the animistic viewpoint. So assuming they're, you know, there's this interesting mix of the Ur of the Chaldees and animistic beginning of pantheonic paganism within the mind of uh, Israel, within the mind of Abraham, you know, when they went to Egypt, they gained a insight into this concept of the eternal soul. It was weird, but it was eternal soul. Still, the Sadducees are in charge until what happened? We have the splitting of Israel, right, into the northern kingdom, and to the southern kingdom. The temple remained in Jerusalem in the southern kingdom. So the king of northern Israel set up two places to sacrifice, right? We don't know when the synagogue system started. There are two views into the development of the synagogue system. When northern Israel was taken by the Assyrians, remember that? That was the Noah thing. Okay, they were all gone because that was the beginning of the way nations did it. The, the beginning of the beginning nations didn't just come in and disarm you. They came in and took you home to be slaves. 
you know, to be part of their thing. And then they repopulated your areas, or sometimes they didn't. They didn't care, right? The first diaspora, they didn't return. In the second diaspora, which is Jerusalem to Babylon, they did return. When you are in the diaspora, what did the diaspora, the original diaspora, cause? The development of what? Well, I kind of said it, but... The synagogue system. The synagogue system is either early date or late date, okay? It's early date, it's in the first diaspora or the split of Israel. Some scholars believe that that's when the synagogue system began. Others believe it was only because of the diaspora, the original diaspora, especially the Babylonian diaspora. In the Babylonian diaspora, the big deal was what group came out of that, or be, what were the beginnings of what group? The Pharisees, the rabbis. They were called rabbis at the time. So I got the Sadducees, they're the beginning, and then I got the rabbis who are going to become the Pharisees. The reason they became the Pharisees was what? The Maccabean era. The Maccabean era is what really made the Pharisees and Sadducees quit. What we had, okay, I got the priests and I got the rabbis. <clears throat> Did priests teach people the scriptures? <clears throat> no. What was their job? Sacrifice. Sacrifice in the temple, right? The temple was not a place of learning. The place of learning was the synagogue. The rabbis handled the synagogue, the priests handled. Now, the Pharisees became the rabbis became the Pharisees. Whether they started as Levites, they probably didn't. They may have. We don't know. We have no idea. We don't have records of this kind of detail. But we know what happened was, so you have, you've got the Pharisees, you've got them in the Maccabean era. This is where we have really good information. In the Maccabean era, the Pharisees, we know the Pharisees were pre-existing at that time. So they kind of appear in the Maccabean era. The big deal difference is that the Pharisees have accepted what viewpoint? The eternal soul. They have basically been Hellenized. They are Hellenized, and that the problem of the Hellenization is what do the Pharisees think about, or the Sadducees think about the Hellenization? Well, at first they're a little happy. If you read the history, go back and read the history. I'm not going to go back over the history. We did it in the Maccabees class. But if you look at Maccabees, there's a terrible situation with the Maccabees because you end up with the Sadducees separated from the Pharisees. Pharisees run the synagogue. They're the rabbis. And the rabbis have accepted Sark, Suke, and Punuma, where the Sadducees still hold to Adam and Nefesh. They have not accepted the concept of eternal soul. So, going back, all right, going back, and I hate to cut off there because there's even more exciting stuff that goes on theologically, but going back to the ultimate question, why would you continue in your viewpoint uh, if it didn't work? The number one answer is because the people in being basically an animist background, they were concerned with food and living. So as long as I'm okay with God, God's okay with me, right? And it doesn't matter when, you know, I die, I die. That's it. You know, the death thing, I mean, it's, it is important to people, okay? But the concept or idea of what happens after death it's held by the Sadducees for a long period of time. In the Sadducee view, there is no life after death. Period. So there's no life after death. What do you don't have to worry about? Life after death. There's no salvation. There's nothing. I don't have to worry about it. Okay? And so the point is, even though there are 36 unforgivables, there isn't a problem because everybody, until the splitting of the kingdoms, Guess where everybody is? As long as you eat, they're okay. As long as you eat and as long as you follow the dictates, right? If you're living in Jerusalem, there's no way you can't hear the Yom Kippur, um, the blowing of the, of the Shafur on Yom Kippur. You can hear it. You, and that's one of the 36, right? And as long as you're straight up, right, 
uh, even though you might kill somebody or, or murder or rape, or, you know, it, as long as you follow the law, right, you, you're pretty much okay, because it doesn't matter, right? It's, Job, Job was written to show you what could happen if you don't, right? If you're not, if you're not true to God. But guess what? Job was punished even though he was true to God. And that puts the whole point on it. Because the Hebrews did not move from animism to pantheonic paganism and mysterion to Gnosticism the way other religions did. It's a strange religion. It was started as animism, but it really quickly moved into this you know, singular God concept. With the, with the mosaic system of sacrifice and cleanliness. <clears throat> the big deal was, until the diaspora, until the splitting of the kingdoms, there wasn't a big deal. It's like Luther's. Luther's sitting, you know, listening to sermons, everything's cool, right? You're going to heaven. Is that really what God meant for Luther's or Christians to be doing? We call them the frozen chosen, Right? You know that's not what you're supposed to be doing. It's just sitting, you know, people come here every Sunday and they think, well, I'm, I'm going to heaven, right? I'm going to heaven. Well, you went to the temple on the temple festivals and you said, what? You didn't even know you're going to heaven. I'm, I'm eating. I'm eating and God is happy, right? And when you were sick and sad and you didn't have any food, you're like, well, God's mad, right? That's, that's the basic view. And until they separated the kingdom, when they first separated their kingdom, they had a problem. What was the problem? You can't sacrifice if you're in the north. The northern guys couldn't sacrifice in the temple, and they're breaking the, they're breaking the law. Right? That's the first problem. So this, why did they care? Why did they care? If they broke the law, I mean, what difference did it make? That's why we got the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees, as we moved on, number one, the Pharisees... We're, we're phil, uh, phyllis, okay, how philosophical do you think the Sadducees were? The Sadducees are popping a beer and doing the sacrifice and eating the meat. Okay, this is cool. What a great life, right? It's like football. It's like Super Bowl Sunday all the time. Okay? But the Pharisees are thinking. The Pharisees are the thoughtful, learning, teaching rabbis. And what are they saying? We in the north can't go to the temple. There's a problem here, right? Now, this doesn't, this isn't like it's in the New York Times and it comes out and they're published. There is no New York Times, right? This takes time for it to seep through the society. It's like anything culturally. It takes time for these ideas to seep into the culture. And so the big deal, this, this is probably the first shock. This is why some people think the synagogue system really started with this split. But then the diaspora, what kind of shock was that? Yeah, you can't do anything. You can't sacrifice. You can't, you know, you, you, all 36, you're toast. And this is where they wrote down all 36, right? And then the Babylonian one. Now, in the Greek era, in the Hellenized Greek era, where are the Jews? All over. All over. And this is before the final one in 125, the real final diaspora that really shot them out into the world. So, you know, what you have is you have a changing thoughts or viewpoints, a lot of it caused by the diaspora and by philosophy. Remember, why do you become an animist to pantheon and pagan? Because you become literate. Why do you go from pantheon and paganism to mysterion? Because you learn philosophy. And why do you go from mysterion to Gnosticism? Because of science. Because you have the scientific method. This is the legal historical method, logic and the scientific method. These are the reasons you move, that religions move between this. So what we're seeing is we're seeing a dynamic within the Hebrew belief structure, right? What really struck them about between the eyes is now we're in the Jesus era, and it's obvious, and we have a tome, a document in Hebrews that does what? Gives us a logos to tell us, that does what? States it emphatically. If you're a Jewish person, right? You're a Jewish person. 
You've been to rabbinic school, whatever. Do you think the rabbis talk about this? Do you think the rabbis, the first day of class, you know, there's 36 things and they're unforgivable and you're toast. And if you do any of them, you're never going to see the Lord God Almighty and that's it. You only go to Sheol. Do you think they say that? Not a great sales bitch. Didn't do your school. That's not a good sales bitch. And by the way, they didn't. The Pharisees said, <clears throat> you'll go to heaven, but you got to do what? Follow the Mosaic law, right? But look what the problem is for every Jew in the diaspora. They can't follow the law, period. This is the problem. And finally, we get a dark. You know, you think this information is ubiquitous. It's not. It's not like people are hiding it, but you're not going to sermons. You know, you're not hearing the sermon in the synagogue. You're not hearing the sermon in a, in a, uh, a, a crusade or an ecclesia where people are telling you these things, right? It's in the fine print. It must be in a fine print until somebody writes Hebrews. Hebrews is our definitive tome that relates to us this historical phenomena. So that is where we are. That is why we are. Now, the other thing I want to mention, I know there are probably questions, but I don't usually touch the theological pool. This is the theological pool. Sorry. It's historical, though, so we're not... We're not trying to do anything on our own. We're just relating what everybody's... Well, anyway, that's, this is so what... So how did that answer the question? I mean, it was very interesting. I, I loved it. But how did it answer the original question? Because and why know. are there still Orthodox Jews? Because they don't know. Because they... Well, why are there still Orthodox Jews? Is because they are still under the same viewpoint. And by the way, the Orthodox Jews are not generally the rabbis as we consider the rabbis. They're not Pharisees. They believe they're Sadducees, the Sadducee class. Right. And they do not accept. Okay. The they said they didn't know. They don't accept. I'll, I'll let, that's better. They do not accept. They, pistis. They are not convinced. Okay. They are not convinced of what should be most obvious to us. Especially, you know, to me the most obvious thing. What are the first words of the Old Testament? In the beginning, Elohim. Okay? And then it goes on to tell us who Elohim is. And then the next words for creation are, man was, let us make man in our image. So either God failed and didn't make man in his image, and we certainly know that God is not Adam and Nefesh. Right? Can't be. Even the Hebrews realize that. Even the Sadducees realize this. They know it. So, yeah, they do not assent. They do not agree. So that's why we have the five you know, groups of Judaism, seven if you believe Eusebius, and we're teen hodos. So never forget, you are teen hodos. You're the group that have been Hellenized and agree, and also we have Hebrews, which is really cool. And that's what we're studying. Well, I think it's <coughs> fascinating that Acts does tell us that a ton of Sadducees, priests, believe mm-hmm. after the resurrection. Yes, I will. That, that is absolutely true. And never, never forget that. As a matter of fact, today in the reading, about 5,000 men in Jerusalem. Right. And it talks about the priests. What is 5,000 men in Jerusalem? Anybody have any idea? How many men in Jerusalem were there? When the festivals weren't there. That's about it. Who what did I say? Twenty thousand. We know because we have we have the census data that was recorded in the Roman period. There were twenty thousand men. We don't know if they're men or total, but we believe they're twenty thousand men, because they counted men and families. Twenty thousand families, let's say, in Jerusalem. Five thousand is how much? That's a huge amount of people, isn't it? In one day. day. Yeah, in one day. And you notice there's no refuting documents? If if that weren't true, don't you think there'd be refuting documents? I would say. Huh? Common knowledge. Why write it down? Well, I'm just saying, you know, if if you were, matter of fact, the Talmud, and here's the Talmud. Um, Judy gave me this, and this is from. Uh, I've talked to you about this before. This is from the Jewish New Testament commentary. Um, When I tell you about the the string, the red string, that comes out of Josephus. uh, She reminded me of this. I thought it was really cool because this kind of proves our context. Um, The Talmud bears, the Talmud, you know, the Talmud, that's the Mishnah, the Talmud commentary, 
bears an amazing witness to the work of Yeshua, uh, Jesus, in altering the system of atonement. The background is on Yom Kippur, when the Kohen Hagdal, that's the high priest, sacrificed a goat, um, that's the scapegoat, a piece of scarlet cloth was tied between its horns. Um, Josephus tells us later that there was this, that it was a string and that he carried the string with him. If it later turned white, it meant God had forgiven Israel's sin in accordance with Isaiah 118, through your, though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. Uh, and here's a quote from Yoma 39a to 39b, that's in the Talmud. Our rabbis taught us that throughout the 40 years that Shimon the Tastik served, the scarlet cloth would become white. From then on, it would sometimes become white and sometimes not. Throughout the last 40 years before the temple was destroyed, the scarlet cloth never turned white. And it's thus, it says, Thus in the day Shimon HaTazik, the sacrificial system established by God in the Tanakh, was observed in the Tanakh, that's the Bible, in the Old Testament, was observed and was effective, but afterwards Israel's spirituality declined so that the sacrificial system was effective only sometimes. Finally, after Yeshua's death 40 years before the destruction of the temple, it was never effective. The Talmud does not say it, but it had become effective for forgiving Jesus, uh, Israel's sin was the sacrificial death of Yeshua, the Messiah. The important thing is, what is interesting and what you always need to remember, and first of all, you see Josephus reports a similar thing, and whether the Talmudic Yoma was written from Josephus or Josephus borrowed from the Talmud. We don't know. Talmud's later, much later than, well, not much later, about the same time as Josephus. So whether, which is which is a share. But the important thing to note is this. How many people do you think, think how many Jewish people do you think, think the sacrificial mosaic system worked? Yeah, honestly. No, that's interesting. How many do you think believe that it worked in the past then? Most. Yeah, most Jews that still believe in Christ, believe in God, right? I mean, there's a huge number of, well, it's just like Christians. There's a huge number of Christians that don't believe in God. But there are a huge amount of Jewish people that don't believe in God anymore, right? So They're just social. Take them off the list. But of those today, I suspect, you know, you're probably right, 100% don't believe that the sacrificial system would work, and that's why they're not fighting for it. The Orthodox Jews are fighting for it big time, right, in Israel, because they, they big time the want it. Rebuild the temple. Well, so, wait a minute. I mean, you, you, made, a you made a statement. Yep. I'm just going to repeat what I heard. Yes. That a whole bunch of Christian people don't believe in God. How can they be Christian if they don't believe in God? Okay, a Christian background, a Christian because to be a Jew, what do you got to be to be a Jew? Jewish mother, child of a Jewish mother, child of a Jewish mother, exactly. So, how, what do you got to do to be a Christian? Yeah, yeah. Some people think being born into a Christian family, exactly. You know, uh, we <laughs> look. Uh, what, what I try to do, all I try to do is give you guys the facts, okay? You say, well, they're my interpretive facts. No, I'm trying to get every piece of fact I give you. It's just like this, okay? When I tell you Josephus talked about it, go check it. Go look at Josephus. I got the notes. Go look at the Yom, the Talmud. Go look at the Bible. Go look at, uh, all I'm trying to do is give you guys facts. Does this theological history make sense to you? Have you ever heard it before? Maybe, maybe not. Parts, yeah. The point is that when we put it together, it should make sense, right? It may not be simple. I think it's pretty simple, but it may not be super simple. Human beings make it complex, more complex than we need to. It's very easy, right? Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. The message that went across the world in that period because people were ready for it. The Sadducees were ready for it. The Pharisees were ready for it. Everybody was ready for it. And all of a sudden it hit. Bang! Now that's a theological statement. That it was the time, God's timing, right? But it was just a historical abnormality, right? It just happened to fit. Yes, sir? When I was in college, I had taken a class one time that was talking about religious history and basically taught that the only reason religions were to answer death. 
to give the followers a reason for not fearing death. But the Jewish answer that you're just dead and in the dirt doesn't seem to apply to that. Well, the animistic, the animism that the, you look at every group, go look at the, all the Stone Age tribes, the Stone Age groups, <clears throat> they will never tell you anything about, you know, rarely, rarely, if they've been touched by a Western theology or Western, you know, view somehow, they might. But in general, if you go look at any animus, any animus writings, well, you can't, because they're pre pre-literate, literate, right? You look at any animistic views, and our knowledge of animistic views, they don't care anything about the afterlife. There is no afterlife for them. And guess what we see? The Sadducees, the Orthodox Jews, atheists. Atheists are, in a way, some kind of animus. Right? Because the only way to be an atheist in the modern world is be ignorant. I mean, you got the Big Bang and you got Immanuel Kant. What else do you need? You know, philosophy and the scientific method prove that, prove the existence of God beyond a shadow of a doubt. And then you got historical, the you know, the legal historical system that would tell you, you know, in the beginning was God. The revelation through history. I don't know, I call that pure ignorance. Yes, sir. Well, now I just got back from Germany. Uh -huh. um, we had some fantastic guides, but when we went through Berlin, that had been obliterated, obliterated, however it's mm -hmm. blown up. <laughs> blown up! <laughs> yep. but all of these, you know, had been totally rebuilt, these massive uh, cathedrals uh, that were now Protestant churches had been rebuilt. And the, I asked the question of the guy. What percent of your population is Christian? Actively participate. He said, he said, 80, I'm Lutheran, but 85% of, of the German population is agnostic. Yes. It's true. It's true. My, my nephew is. But why? why I mean, they spent millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars rebuilding all of these churches. Why would 85% of the population agree to have this money spent to rebuild something they don't believe in? Well, that's a great question. The question I have is why are they agnostics? And I know the answer. I can tell you the answer right now. Who controls the school system? Government. Government controls schools. <laughs> equal so agnostics, so equal atheists. Period. Dot. You will never get, you will never, ever achieve Christianity, a religion based in truth, or truth in a government-controlled school system. And you see it all over Europe. It's at least the same way. Two but, years. But that didn't answer the question. If but they didn't believe, why would they allow funds? See, a lot of it was historical. My niece is married to a, um, a German minister, and he serves in Berlin. And he cannot have his ministry out at a church, because nobody will go to a church. They um, worship in a, like an office building. And... Um, so it's, they're museums. It's a store. They're museums. Museum. Yeah. A lot of the churches we can tell you are office buildings. They have offices in there of businesses and things. They're not churches. And it's it's the most challenging ministry because um, they're very intellectual people in that Berlin community, but they do not want to have anything to do with it. And here's the point, okay? As we are turning into this time. Okay, we're moving into this time. This, I'm not talking about today. I'm talking about the first century. Okay, the first century. What were the Sadducees looking for? What were the Pharisees and the Sadducees looking for? Well, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were looking for a Messiah. Right? They're both looking for a Messiah. But the Sadducee Messiah was a king Nationalistic king to bring them out of Roman rule or, you know, whatever rule they're under. I don't know. They're under every kind of rule, right? But the Pharisees were looking for a Messiah who would be a priest. Savior. A savior. Yeah, high priest and king. We'll say high priest and king, but equals a savior. A savior. 
because they believed in the eternal soul of man, just like the Greeks, and by the way, almost every other religion or, or group, almost every other group of people, once you move out of animism, you gain the belief, one of the functional beliefs out of animism is in the eternal soul, which is very interesting that science is totally immune to that. But in any case, the words of the day. Uh, okay. Uh, yes. So because of that, were most of the original Queen Hodos people former Pharisees? So now they have an opportunity to get their Savior, uh, which, was, which is what they've been looking for. We don't know. The Pharisaic structure controlled almost everything. They did not control the Sanhedrin. Remember the Sanhedrin? We know that four of the members of the 70 were Pharisees. It, we know that for a fact. One of them was um, uh, Gamaliel, right? But we know from records, from Josephus' records, that four of them in the 70. So they did not control the Sanhedrin. What they controlled was the synagogue. Who was trained in the synagogue? Paul. Every man was trained in the synagogue. So the Pharisees control. The Pharisaic message was powerful, and, and I don't know what the percentage is, but I could guess that since the Pharisees peddled this message of the Messiah, right? That was one of their main things, and the eternal soul. Probably a huge percentage of the pe general people came to know, came to be members of Teen Hodos because of that. But we also know it says in Acts that many priests, and by the way, we believe that the, that Luke was written to Theodolus, who may have been a high priest. So we we know that lots of the Sadducees were ready for this message too. So I can't answer the question of the percentage. But it appears like a huge number of the Jews joined Teen Hodos. Yes, sir. It's kind of ironic. They understood back then, you, you controlled the schools and you controlled the mines. <laughs> the leadership didn't control it. We've just kind of forgotten that now, and it's gotten flip-flopped. Well, whether it was actually intentional, the Sadducees made a mistake, right? Because they let the Pharisees control the synagogue schools. Yeah. From which group did Paul... Learn Paul was a Pharisee. Pharisee, Pharisee, okay. Pharisee of Pharisees. Yeah, yeah. Paul was a huge Pharisee. Talking about, huh? Wasn't Nicodemus a Sadducee? Wasn't he a part of Sanhedrin? He was a Sanhedrin, and, and, and we don't know whether he was or not. I don't believe. Yeah, it, he may have been because of the question. But, you know, that is a beautiful. Someone should do a movie about Nicodemus. Yes, sir. One minute sideline. Go off different. Oh, there's a movie going on now about Paul. Yeah. Yes. Has anybody seen it? Is it worth yeah. going to? I've heard it. Is. Somebody said it was really good. It was very good. I've heard it. Thank you. I just, that's, that's enough. Thank yeah. You. Well, at least <laughs> we're <laughs> seeing some. They, what, why don't they make movies like this, right? Whoa. Okay. All right. Anyway, the words of the day uh, K L E R O N O M I A S. Claire. Claire Nomius. Claronomias. That's pretty good. Huh? That's good on me. Okay. Um, Claire, Claros, Cleo, to break, as in bread, to break, break up, and nomos, nomos, which is law. <coughs> law, or uh, more specifically, this uh, onomia is, um, uh, nomia means law. But what this means is to break into parcels. So when you inherit, right, here's your father's land, and I have uh, four sons. So one son, one, two, three, four, <coughs> that's Claronomius. Okay? So I'm, I, that's the inheritance. That means inheritance. Parabasis, and the reason I gave you this word, parabasion. Parabasis, parabasis, para, near, basis, foot, or pace. Now we would think parabola, right? Parabola means to be, to be thrown near to, right? To throw near to meaning a positive. I 
bring this word up, and I want to say more about it. We don't have a lot of time. Sorry, sorry. That's the problem with theology, right? Um, sorry. I hope I hope you appreciated that, and it was not detracting to the class. But someone had asked, and, and Ann isn't here because she asked a question specifically. And if she asked a question, I know it was on all your minds. So that's that's why I wanted to try to answer it succinctly as possible in 45 minutes. But in any case. <laughs> We would think that near foot, para, most of the para words are positive and not negative, right? This is interpreted negatively, and I'm not sure it's exactly interpreted correctly. Now, I didn't pull out my woodhouse and dig into it deeply, but I'm not sure that this word, it, the parabasis is a violation. Violation. Because violation meaning that you're near, okay, in the Hebrew view, this could be pretty close, and that's a problem, right? If I interpret this one in a Hebrew context, remember the way, right? If I'm in the way, Jesus' admonition was don't, and if you're near the way but not in the way, you're is not. that a problem? That's a problem, right? So near pace or almost at pace it's translated violation, but I would say that ain't exactly the most correct interpretation of the Greek. Near stepping, although may not be harmatia or, or maybe missing the mark, right? Strayed. You may be well, you're still near. It's but not you're like strayed. you're you're not like off. It's not apo basis. It's not off, right? Your, it implies you can return. It implies you're close. So you may be out of step, but you're close, right? Which we would say that's kind of positive. It's better than nothing, but that ain't enough. I don't think it hurts the translation or the thing, but I don't think it's exactly correct. So anyway, we were at verse 13, and I think we only have time to review verse 13. The blood of lamb, uh, goats and bulls, and the ashes of heifer sprinkle on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. Remember, we said this is talking about cleanliness and not the sacrificial system per se. The cleanliness was a requirement for the sacrificial system to eat truma. So let's go to verse, <clears throat> let's go to verse 14. Let's see if I can get a, a verse 14 out here. Here's the NIV. How much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. <laughs> this, this isn't exactly what it says, but let's see what it says in the Greek. It's close. It's, it's a relatively close to so its happiness. Posos, how much melon, more-er, more-er. Uh, it's funny, Greek has a word like that, more-er, right? More-er. Shall, it's not shall, it's Kath arizo, to purge the blood, the hamia of Christ. Pos, who, dia, uh, the is added, the uh, enios, uh, en, en eos. Remember, this is a word yesterday that we usually have aion, a i o n, and this is a i o n o s. Aion is age, aionis is ages. Eternity, basically, or all the ages, perpetually. Um, Aeonis, of the ages, penuma, offered, and suddenly for sparrow, so to bear towards our offering word, himself, heoto, himself, uh, that's the reflexive pronoun, without spot, and it's uh, literally am omos, without blame, without blame, ho, the god, Katha zero, to purge Haman, your sonidesis, not conscious, but literally your ability to see together. Your ability to see together. They've translated this word conscious, and it doesn't fit. I should have given you sonidesis. I probably should give it to you some other day. But sonidesis literally means together to see. It's sun, sone, Sunedesis, and it comes from together and ideo. Ideo, video, ideo is to see. So together to see together. That does not have anything to do with conscious. How can you conscious and see together? 
common point of view? Yeah, it's more of a common point of view, but in the Greek, remember, the Greeks would never use this word. If they meant a common point of view, they would have said, sune um, suke, or something similar to that, right? Sune uh, gnosis, sune gnoia, sune thinking together, right? But this says to see together. In other words, it's concrete. It's something we can all see together. It's not conscious. It's completely opposite to conscious. So uh, why they this? And I'm not talking. I'm not talking off the cuff of our translation. I'm talking from the Greeks, uh, Vines and Strong, okay, and from Woodhouse. This word does not mean conscious, and I have no idea why they translate Could conscious. Could we stretch to original truth? Uh, no. It's it's what we it's what we agree happened. It's like. Um, well, wouldn't that be obvious? I say yes. Uh, the Greeks are smarter than that because if we all, if we, if somebody had an accident in this room and all the police came and interviewed us, each of us might have a different view from our viewpoint and even an opinion of what happened. And we would not, we, we might have a sunadesis, but the sunadesis would have to be put together by the police, right? And so our sunadesis is what we all agreed happened. But it's like aircraft accidents when they, when you ask people. You know, to you know, interview them, and they have all kinds of funny ideas about what was happening, right? And so you don't come to a, you, you hopefully, in a court of law or in an accident ward, come to a sunadesis for what happened, but it may not be what people see. So I think this is a very important word, but it doesn't mean conscience at all. And, it, and that, okay, let's continue. From apo off necros, work, ergion, toil, to ice, to serve, latur, to minister, not. Not serve. Remember this latero word? <laughs> Latrio. This does not mean to serve. What does this word mean? This is an administrative, this is ministry. It's ministry and it's Roman, as opposed to the Greek word, which is uh, deacon. Deaconess. Deaconess, right? Deacon. That's where you get deacon from. Okay, anyway, I hope you, you bore with it. Thank you. We'll continue next week. I will be gone after the 6th, so I think I'll be good, but in May, May the 6th is when I should be gone, probably to the end, and then I usually don't teach in the summer semester. So in any case, we'll work it out, and I'll be here next week. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for what you give us and do for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, God, I should say God willing, I'll be here. My own priest always say. Like I asked you this before, but the New Testament. Was